Saturday evening in and around the peninsula, welcome to Beyond 3D. Matt and Clint here with you, looking forward to having a fantastic show tonight, and hopefully you guys had a fantastic week. Clint, how have you been? I'm beyond excited oh, good. right now, Matt, beyond because excited. Uh, boy, do we have a Beyond 3D exclusive? We most tonight. certainly do. We most yeah. certainly do. Hopefully you guys are doing well out there. There's one thing I wanted to do because I think it is absolutely necessary, and I know, Clint, you will get this as soon as I do it. So let's just see if I have everything set up here correctly. You have a look on your face of, what is that all about? No, it's just, uh, my headphones just stopped working that very second you played whatever that was. Oh, well, what I decided to do was this on? week we lost a very important actor that oh, played look, James Bond. Did you just play Bond. the James Bond theme? No. I couldn't hear it. Oh, I'll do it again. No, don't. <laughs> it's, I, I want to get to our guest. We've got okay. a guest tonight. Okay. Now talk to me about it. James Bond died. That was Roger James Moore. But Roger Moore passed Roger away, Moore. but I don't like him as James Bond. I liked him as Lord Brett Sinclair in The Persuaders with Tony Curtis, and that was the theme written by John Barry for The Persuaders. Okay. Well, that would have been wasted on me because I've never seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell you, that. I tell you what. I, as a James Bond, mm -hmm. he kind of was my James Bond, but. I couldn't... There were so many really bad things. Like, I remember him as James Bond laying in a alligator. I remember that one. That one just didn't gel. That no. was the Voodoo Island, I think. He was in a... Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah, motorized yeah, 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 alligator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good yeah, lord. I know. <laughs> anyway, guys, um, God bless Roger Moore. We love the movies and everything like that. But uh, this week on Beyond 3D, we have an extremely special guest to present to you. I suggest everyone tonight turns down the lights, hmm. turns off your phone... And open your hearts and minds to our guest and yours, Matt. He is a historian, mm -hmm. an ex-civilian communications officer with Commander Naval Air Forces Pacific Fleet. Yep. And he's in a knowledge of all things reptilian, mine labs, and the SSP are all about to blow everyone's minds. That's the way. James Bartley, welcome, friend, this evening to Beyond 3D. Thank you, Clint. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. Thank you for having me on. Well, we're... Both Matt and I are pleased to have you. We've Absolutely. We've been name-dropping you over the last three years, and it's good to finally have you on the show. <laughs> well, it's, it's my pleasure, and, and thank you and Matt for getting me on here. No, it's Sorry. very, very important, James, because um, as our listeners would know, we do talk about you quite often, and we would like you tonight, James, to, in your time, in your cadence, and with your vast knowledge, share with everybody what a, is a reptilian and what is a my lab. That, those are two very good questions. The reptilians, in the view of myself and my mentor, Barbara Bartholik, who basically taught me a lot and really kind of groomed me for the work I'm doing now, the reptilians are the primary abducting force. They have a lot of cosmic vassals working for them. They've carved out this niche for themselves where they have a number of cosmic vassals, the ubiquitous greys, uh, similar beings that do a lot of the heavy lifting, do a lot of the medical work, but behind the scenes, the reptilians, and particularly the Draco, the Draco are the winged reptilians, and the white Draco seems to be at the top of the heap, and I'm sure some of your listeners may have had encounters with the reptilians and or the Draco, and there's basically three kinds of reptilians, uh, not mutually exclusive, there's a lot of intermixing, there's the subterranean reptilians of various uh, species and uh, varieties. Uh, they've lived underground all along. Then there's the extraterrestrial reptilians who come from other worlds in our cosmos. They get here via spaceships as well as stargates. And you have, for lack of a better term, interdimensional reptilians. These are reptilians that, as David Icke would call it, reside in the lower fourth dimension. And over time, in the recent past, more and more of them have decided this is a whole other story, have decided to start incarnating into uh, physical 3D bodies. Some, some bodies, uh, human bodies, as well as reptilian bodies, have been prepared for them. And so these interdimensional reptilians, they've decided, some of them, after like thousands of years of linear time, they've decided it's time to start being in physical embodiment again for whatever reason. I don't know what that portends. But, yeah, so generally there's underground dwellers, there's 
reptilians from outer space, and there's interdimensional reptilians, and some reptilians are all three. Some reptilians are from off-world. They've established underground bases here for a, a long time, and they have the ability to alter their density. So for all intents and purposes, they can be interdimensional. They can enter into your dreamscape and manipulate you during your dreamscape, eroticize your dreamscape, uh, make your dreamscape very frightening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's actually quite frightening, James, isn't it, when you stop and think about the fact that they're more predatory than we are. Yes, and they've managed to imbue these, these onerous predatory characteristics in these hybridized bloodlines, and that's the main problem we have that, you know, like the stories of the Nephilim, the stories of how they came and they saw the earth women as being fair, took them up as wives and begat offspring from them. And then out of these hybridized bloodlines, they created these patriarchal priesthoods to enforce their laws, enforce their way of thinking. Uh, they went about eradicating just about every vestige of the divine feminine worship, which was the, uh, the predominant form of worship here on the surface for countless millennia. Well, I, I think a lot of this really kicked in a high gear after the most recent spate of celestially driven cataclysms. And that was only about 11, 12,000 years ago. In geological time, that was last week. And we're on the cusp of those ge celestially driven cataclysms again. And so the last time these cataclysms happened, there was a much smaller surface population uh, in the aftermath. And it gave these reptilians and other negative parasitical beings, beings the opportunity to manipulate a much smaller bloodline and create all these hybridized bloodlines which they've controlled uh, since then well i'm glad i asked matt that was a mouthful thanks yeah. james that was amazing no, no, absolutely it's it's interesting um in dealing with the reptilians um i was reading up on some of your work and you uh also there was a reference that came to Krito mutwa and uh in south africa or in lesotho and uh, he was also talking about what happened in the distant well not so distant past and the fact that they had encounters with beings that he would describe as reptilian as well so it's interesting um what you do and the clarity that you bring to that topic i want to ask you something it's a little bit off the cuff um i just have to get this out there because of some experiences i've had now you can give me your opinion on them um I think we both know and all of us know what's going on in the United States right now, at least politically. If I had to ask you the question, the question would be this. What are your impressions of the current president of the United States in so far as dealing with the whole reptilian agenda? And I'll tell you why I'm asking that question after you give me your initial opinion. I believe that Donald Trump is just the latest example of a hybridized president. He came from a particular family, a particular bloodline. So these entities, and it's not just reptilians, but they're, uh, they're one of the main forces, as we know, uh, to work through him, to work through his bloodline. And not only him, but he's going to be surrounded by all these so-called advisors. And even if Trump, let's just say that he managed to slip through the cracks and he really has good things in mind. I mean, all you have to do is look back at the example of Jack Kennedy. He's only going to get away with so much. So, uh, unfortunately, and there's nothing wrong with hope. A lot of people have hope, and there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of people invested a lot of emotional, mental energy in into Donald Trump, and a lot of them are being disappointed because he does fall into one of those hybridized bloodlines. I don't think one can be a president or even like a, a congressman or a senator without being, or a CEO or an executive of a major corporation without being one of these hybridized bloodlines. I think it, it, they've created a sphere of influence for themselves, these reptilians and the hybrids they work through, and they're loath to let an outsider, if you will, uh, elbow their way in. That's fair enough. Now, the reason I asked that um, is because I do a lot of spiritual work, and the person that we know as the current president of Donald Trump right now, in my opinion, what I have seen is he is working with entities on multiple levels not just this earth and this timeline that we know that has been my experience what i have um seen for lack of a better term and that's why i wanted to ask you that question because what i'm seeing i, I would agree with you but it's on multiple levels there's a heck of a lot more going on than just meets the eye and it has a lot more to do with spirituality not just the mundane and what we normally see so that's very interesting yeah, and it's interesting that you would bring that up, Matt, because in the recent past, I'm trying to remember which friend of mine mentioned this to me, but uh, the subject of Donald Trump came up, and she had had encounters with Donald Trump in, in the inner planes, and they had a discussion, and 
uh, I can't remember the, the, the context of discussion, something along the lines of, you know, she has a certain job to do and and then she should do it and, you know, just get on with the job. And I don't know if she regarded that as an order from him, a peremptory order, or that he was trying to bully her or whatever the case may be, but she really felt it was him, an aspect of him in these inner planes. And it's not unusual that these high-ranking politicians would have such psi abilities, would be able to operate freely in the inner planes because, uh, you know, down through the ages, many of these politicians uh, and people in these, these royal bloodlines, if you will, they are adepts, many of them. They have magical and what they would have called magical abilities at a certain time. They have highly attuned psychic abilities and they are in contact at some different levels with non-human intelligences, let's say. That's very much the norm at those political levels. Oh, James, let me tell you, what you just said is music to my ears because what your friend went through, I can tell you, I went through a very similar thing. And they are testing in these different planes of existence who can do certain things at certain levels. And if you do not meet their criteria, it's almost as if they dismiss you and move on to somebody else. That is what your friend went through. I had an absolutely similar experience in the inner worlds. It was that's fascinating. Yeah, and see, they, they profile us, so psychologically profile us, they're... They know about our past lives. They know about our genetic profile better than we do. And that's why so many of us that have been born into this earthly plane and have had these kinds of challenges, these entities and these deep black military elements seem to know more of us, more about us from the word go, mm. right? And so they psychologically profile us, and they know that some people are more susceptible to one form of persuasion or coercion and sometimes they try to activate the ego of somebody. If you work for us, you can have all these things. You can do great things, and we can make you a great person, whatever. And so they try different means based on someone's psych profile to get them on board. And if they can't turn them, get them on board, oftentimes, sadly, they try to disrupt their life so much that they uh, they are no longer a factor. That you know, Because they view a lot of people with these psi abilities as being a, a latent threat uh, and they don't they either want them on board or they want their lives so disrupted and destabilized they no longer propose a threat fair enough hey james is it more in, are, are people more inclined to have these kind of experiences if they're more left brain than right brain that's a very good question i think that the left brain people are actually more vulnerable to this kind of uh, interdimensional, very subtle, nuanced persuasion and manipulation, because they're manipulated from the beginning to to think that that the inner planes don't exist, that everything is reductionist in nature, down to you know atoms and then down to some subatomic particles. Everything has to be quantified, measured. Everything has to be tangible. So people like that, and then when you give them all this bogus information <laughs> because the scientists on the surface they don't work with the same data database that the scientists in the deep black weird science project uh, do that's a given so and the way that the college system on the surface works they they basically do psych profiles in everybody they know who to graduate they know who to move up through the ranks and who eventually to give tenureship uh, wind up letting be professors so they can they know that if their egos are activated, they'll, they can be counted on to wittingly or unwittingly push certain agendas and push certain bogus science models. So I think actually, ironically, people that are really left brain that are cut off from uh, no, knowing what their body is telling them, they're, they're unable to pick up impressions from the environment, they're unable to discern different energies, they're, I think they're far more vulnerable to people uh, rather to uh, manipulation. That's why you see so many of those types in these weapons programs at places like Lawrence Livermore Lab and in San Diego and Los Alamos. They're there. They've got all these toys. They're building these weapons of mass destruction, and, and they think it's a cool thing. But really, a lot of their inspiration, a lot of their ideas, they're not original. They're just entities, literally, that are giving them these ideas. And they've got unlimited funding, and it's a, if it feels good, do it. There's no consequences. There's no, no ethics, no morality that they have to adhere to. So they're given the means, a lot of these left brain people. It, also, you see this in the corporations, too, where, you know, these really fast climbers, they're, they're sociopaths, they're psychopaths, a lot of them. They're narcissists. And so 
even if they don't believe in the supernatural, they can still serve an agenda. And on the other hand, there are those that are in corporations that very well know that there is an unseen realm or realms, uh, and they're the ones that really are calling the shots, and they have a lot of underlings that are more of the left brain variety. But, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but I really no, I... do believe that people with left brain, they're easier to plug into this matrix. No, that's cool, James, because I was thinking along the lines of where you look at psychology with neurology and the knock-on effect that that has with genetics when you're looking at left brain, right brain people that are more susceptible. Well, absolutely, because you have all these Dudley do-rights in the military, law enforcement, the security services. Yes, Al-Qaeda is out there. Well, now we'll call them ISIS. And, and so they're given this authority. They have these big, powerful institutions behind them. Their egos are activated. And they really believe in what they're doing. And they really want to believe. And so the whole concept of tuning into the, the, the information they're provided sussing it out, being able to determine if what they're being fed is valid or not, I don't think that that happens. They're, the information a lot of these people in the security services are given is very much cherry-picked. It, it's tailor-made to push a certain narrative, a certain agenda, and the psych profile they were, of the people they recruit into those uh, those corporations, into the intelligence security services, into the military, in the higher ranks of the military, they just don't question. They're in it for the power. They want to carve out a niche uh, and do a little bit of empire building uh, for themselves. So really, it's a perfect storm because there's so many people now that are of that ilk, of that mindset, of that left brain thinking. And that left brain thinking, especially when the ego is activated, that enmeshes them further into this matrix. Beyond, 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 breathe, 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 breathe. D, D, D. Welcome back tonight to Beyond 3D. You're with Matt and Clint on a Saturday night. Our special guest, Matthew. James is here with us. James Bartley. And James, thank you for your time tonight. We've just been chatting about left brain, right brain in regards to the reptilians and those kind of experiences. And James just said something that I found very interesting. Oh, because t- what, what hasn't I, he said that's I interesting? I know, but what I wrote down as he was speaking about that in the last break, I wrote down, if you are a what-if type of person, they need to get rid of you. Of course they do. And I'll tell you what else is something that's very interesting while James was talking that I recollected upon. Mm-hmm. Remember, James, we've had Duncan Rhodes on the show um, last two years. Yeah. Duncan talks about, has he ever told you the Lush story? Yeah, it's the first time I came across the Lush. I think Robert Monroe was talking about that. Yes. But I don't know about the, the contents that Duncan uh, meant. Uh, what did he talk about? Well, Duncan talked about Lush being a, how would you say it, Matt? A vibrational force that, we ex- that comes off us in negative situations. It could be negative or it could be positive. Or positive, but it's like a food source. It's a food source, an energy food source. A parasitic, vampiric food source. Yes, I would agree with that. And these parasitic entities strive to keep us in this lower frequency bandwidth of misery, hopelessness, despair, loneliness, lack of self-worth, etc., etc. And then they they exacerbate all that with the the fear-mongering of the media. They hammer us with a psychiatric tyranny. Oh, you're too happy. You're too sad. We got a pill for every occasion, right? So they strive, and also you add in the GMOs and everything else. Being ill, constantly, chronically ill, yeah, that those people can be depressed. It is understandable. So we all exude, we are emitters of resonance and frequency, and it behooves these negative entities to keep us in a lower vibratory bandwidth because emotions, energy and motion, when we're bummed out, when we're depressed and we're blues, we're just pumping out their food and they just feed off at our expense. And it's a spiral effect downwards, isn't it? I mean, if you're spiritually retarded or vibrationally challenged, you're easy pickings. Yes, and there's the other end of the spectrum too where people in the, in the Orthodox religions, and it's a very tangible thing, uh, this thing they call the Holy Spirit, but what I would describe as a demiurgic kind of AI kind of force, where people work themselves up in a frenzy in these Orthodox religions, be it Baptist, Baptist or whatever the case may be. I mean, they're speaking in tongues, they're rolling around on the floor, and that's kind of an extreme example. But even in uh, Orthodox religions that are not as extreme as that, the hysteria that they can kind of work themselves up into, that is fed upon too. Nothing is left on the buffet table, whether it's extreme, raucous, riotous uh, happiness that you can find in like a big sporting event or a concert or at the other end of the spectrum, 
uh, really negative uh, base emotions. The whole the whole miasma of it, right? All across the board: vulgarity, perversity, uh, rage, uh, resentment, all that stuff. They feed off that because we are emitters. We're, we're resonators of frequency, and so they're going to get us going in the highs and lows. And that's why it's important for us to stay embodied, stay grounded plugged into Mother Earth. The New Agers got it all backwards. They always talk about ascending. And so what happens is they get literally out of their body. They get too much of their headspace. And that's why so many of them get, unfortunately, taken up as host or you know, by entities and wind up having all these entity attachments precisely because they're not embodied. After James just said all that, Matt, you know two words that came to my mind? Go for it. Bohemian Grove. Yes. <laughs> Bohemian Grove, yeah, satanic worship. Yeah, and it's all around us. This whole thing with Manchester, I just did a commentary about it. If you look at the the song that Drake, the rapper, did, he did a performance of his song Gialchester in Las Vegas the day before what happened in Manchester. And if you read the lyrics of Gialchester, and it's about uh, ostensibly about the uh, parish of Manchester on the island of Jamaica, in particular the pretty girls in the parish of Manchester in Jamaica. But actually, it was really about the young girls, the little girls in Manchester, UK. And if you look at the lyrics of that song, in the first stanza, uh, he, he, uses the word, he uses the word Barry, B-U-R-Y. There's actually a suburb called Barry in Manchester. And then he, he also talks about Hermes. And the very first word in the song, of course, that's Thoth, the Hootie, uh, it's just, uh, the messenger of the gods, so the god of magic. Uh, Hermes uh, brought people, brought souls to the underworld, to Hades. I mean, I mean, and then the second stanza, he starts out talking about the firm. And the firm, as many people know in intelligence circles, is slang for MI6, uh, SIS, another word for it, uh, the British Intelligence Service. So that song that he sang the day before Manchester happened. And see, another thing that's going on, too, is there's been so many blatantly hoaxed events that nowadays it's like a knee-jerk reaction. Anything happens, people automatically assume it's a hoax event. No real casualties. It's just all just a psychodrama. And then the powers that be put out enough woo-woo, numerology, uh, occult symbology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they put out enough of these pictures of crisis actors, what have you. And there's a tendency amongst many people to just to write it off as a non-event where people were not really harmed or not really killed. And I believe that's happened a number of times. But I think what it did was it lulled people into a, into a sort of complacency because they don't realize, uh, many of them are what I call surface level thinkers. They don't realize that sometimes they really do require a very public massacre, a very public bloodletting uh, for whatever energetic ceremonial purpose, right? And so that's what we see going on with Manchester. I've got personal friends in Manchester and they're telling me people really disappeared, people really got killed. So it's not just a question of another hoax event. Something really happened, but now there's all these divisions. If you go onto Facebook, there's wars that's erupted between people who say it's all a hoax and the site and forward all these pictures showing all these crisis actors laying around with fake blood and you know pretending to be hurt, pretending to be scared. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that there really wasn't people harmed. And if there were people harmed, in order to continue this fiction, continue this fractiousness and acrimony, they're certainly not going to put out pictures of people being you know, maimed and killed. Well, we don't see pictures of soldiers in these wars getting killed. We never see that. We never see pictures of the bodies being brought back to Dover Air Force Base uh, from overseas of all the people killed uh, in these endless, uh, pointless wars. So they can easily cover up the number of deaths of people all across the board and just make people argue about whether it's, you know, hoaxed or not. You know, I mean, granted, it's a false flag uh, because whoever was behind it, they had to know a lot about numerology, about uh, about ancient comedian magic, about Greek mythology, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, to just automatically assume that no one was killed. No, people need to have a deeper insight and understanding about these things. Uh, James, I wanted to get into gray aliens and the different species that they are and the fact that, in my opinion at least, I wanted to see if it's your opinion as well, artificial intelligence or robotics. I would agree, yeah, to some extent, because they, they have a hive consciousness. Can I ask and a quick... they all seem to look alike. They seem to be asexual. They don't 
although people that are around them or, or have had a lot of encounters with them seem to differentiate between ones that exude a more feminine energy or uh, vice a more masculine energy, I think that applies to certain groups of them mm-hmm. where that kind of difference between masculine and feminine is more energetically apparent. But I think that a lot of them that are out there they're just doing the heavy lifting for the reptilians, the Draco, the Mantis, and other beings. I think that they're, they're basically a cybernetic organism that's a form of AI that's ideally uh, crafted to operate these craft, operate the technology. To be sure, I think some of them are trying to carve out their own niche, doing their own bit of empire building. Uh, as I mentioned in my podcast today, the Draco and the reptilians will have hands-on involvement in the medical work for particular individuals. They will not trust their underling cosmic vassal grays to do some of the work on particular individuals because they fear that the grays who are, again, they're using the, the DNA to kind of upgrade their own species. They, I mean, you look at them, they run into a biological dead end pretty much, right? So a lot of the reptilians and grays for specific, specific families and specific individuals, they will not let them work on particular individuals. Uh, but getting back to your question, I, I think that, yes, they are for the a lot of, and there's more than one, there's a number of factions of them. A lot of them basically are just high consciousness, kind of cybernetic organisms. So they, they lack real emotions. They're all completely intellect. Uh, if it feels good, you know, do it. They have no qualms about subjecting us to physical or emotional duress and pain. Uh, that means nothing to them. It's gotten to the point where I, I think that the military may be cloning these grays out because in some of the my lab experiences I'm familiar with, uh, there were instances of grays actually taking orders from the military people. So, uh, you know, there you go. My question earlier, James, was going to be, Matt called them some kind of AI or some kind of robotics, but... Um our human concept of robotics is more Terminator style, where you have moving metal parts. But these are organic robotics, aren't they? I would I would agree with that. And the danger lies. And look at how many people out there are giving lectures and writing books about how much they love the Greys, how how they used to be a Grey, or they have a Grey consciousness indwelling within them. These people are more than halfway towards being plugged into the to the Borg Collective. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because. I mean, why would anyone want to be like a gray and be uh, emotionless, be homogeneous and identical to everyone else of their own species and with no differentiation, no individuation, nothing like that, right? Everyone shares the same Borg-like de- de- destiny. Why would anyone strive to be like the grays? But unfortunately, that that's the case. And see, reptilians are not the only ones that take people up as hosts. I mean, it depends on the genetic profile of the individual there are some people that have a lot of gray dna so like a certain type of seer mystic psychic can look at these individuals and they see indwelling within them a gray entity just as like for some people a mystic would see like a mantid entity or a reptilian overshadowing somebody indwelling within somebody sometimes people walk around with these grays attached to them right so you know that's going on too but really the grays are a form of artificial intelligence. They're, they're a manifestation of that. They interface with the technology easily because, you know, they're, they're one and the same with the technology. And that's why they're so involved in the genetic hybridization process because they've reached a dead end. They can't go any further biologically uh, from an evolutionary standpoint. They need our DNA. They need us. We don't need them. That's very interesting. I am... Um... I remember there was a video out, and uh, for all of the people out there who say, oh, the Greys, you know, it's a little TV thing, they're not really real, take a look at a video that was on YouTube back in 2007, 2008 over Turkey, where a fellow actually filmed a craft, and as you zoom into the craft, you can actually see what looks like Greys piloting this thing. Yeah, so, that's a classic video. Yeah. Yes, it is. And so you have to you have to look at all of these things and say, hey, wait a minute, look at what's going on here. There's a lot more than meets the eye. Another thing, too, for some time now, we've been in the digcam age. We've been in the mobile phone camera age. So now more than ever, people have uh, cameras with them at yeah. all times. So uh, for some time now, people have been sending Jaime Masson, the uh, Mexican UFO investigator. In fact, he's the host for the Mexican equivalent of 60 Minutes, right? The TV show. Right. And 
many people over the years have sent him pictures where uh, it'll be the middle of the night out in the woods somewhere and a couple of people are mugging for the camera. Lo and behold, you look in the background, there's a little E.T. back there, right? Mm. And you can tell by the way it's posing that, okay, you know, it's kind of tilted over, it's kind of leading over. That's not a dummy or a puppet because the fulcrum point is off. It would tip over, okay? I mean, there's nothing around it, no bushes or branches or something to hold this thing up. It seems to be in motion, right? And mm. and that's happening more and more. More and more people are not only getting pictures of, of UFOs, they're getting pictures of these ETs of various stripes, often the grays, but not, not exclusively grays. And it goes back to the interdimensional capability of some of these entities, how they can alter their density. Because I know people that have gotten pictures of reptilians. I mean, they're in, in the image, the, the being is somewhat translucent. You can see kind of a, a, a faint outline of them. You can see behind, through them, you can see the furniture or the hallway or whatever behind them, but you can see a faint outline. And also a friend of mine, Barbara Cruz, she pioneered the uh, the use of Photoshop editing where, you know, messing around with contrast and, and whatnot, you can actually bring out detail in what is just a photograph of, say, like an attic, uh, an empty room, a clearing uh, in a forest somewhere. Actually, the adroit use of, of the contrast and solarization, etc., there's all kinds of entities, there's all kinds of things in those spaces that we just can't perceive with our regular uh, you know, vision, but it's there nonetheless. So what she started seeing was all these entities overshadowing politicians, overshadowing uh, Hollywood artists, et cetera, et cetera, musical artists. Uh, she would pull out details like entities standing around some kind of a machine, right? And so she started going through a lot of harassment. I mean, a lot of harassment. And she was the first one to do that. I don't know if anyone who's, who's done it since, but as David Icke points out, it's like we can only see a tiny portion of the visible spectrum there's so much going on around us anyone who's felt presences energetic presences around them knows what i'm talking about and anyone who's observed dogs and cats observing activity in and around the house that you know we can't see knows what i'm talking about i mean there's entities and there's uh, presences and energies all around us we just have to be uh you know tuned in so we can feel the presence Welcome back to Beyond 3D tonight. Matt, we have James Bartley live on the show. Indeed we do. And it's our pleasure tonight to share him with everybody tonight. Hey, James, got a question in regards to history. Sure. How do you feel, or what's your opinion, on Draco or snake entities that we see in ancient Chinese history and medieval England? Yeah, and indeed throughout all the cultures of the world, I, I believe it's real. See, nowadays the academics uh, dismiss the stories, the lore from traditional peoples and, and now unfortunately extinct cultures as being, you know, the mutterings of stupid superstitious people, right? And, and look at how they treat you know, Egyptology. It's all very much uh, selective, it's arbitrary, it's cherry picking, right? Like the Egyptian, ancient Egyptians, Egyptians themselves say their culture goes back 36,000 years, but okay, the Egyptologists don't want to hear that. And look at the Sumerologists that study ancient Sumeria, right? They can bore you to tears talking about, you know, all these different shards of pottery and, and the cuneiform text about jurisprudence, about, about weights and measures, and about agricultural yields. But when you start talking about, well, yeah, look at their cosmology. They're saying that these Anunnaki gods came from outer space and they, they genetically interfered with with humanity. Oh, no, that's superstitious mumbo-jumbo, you see. And that's the tendency that these quackademics have. But when you look at the, the lore of these people, uh, like the Ojibwe Indians, for example, in North America, their creator god is Nanabush. And Nanabush warred with the lizard people. It, it's right there in their lore that Nanabush, whoever their creator god is, whoever he's equivalent to in the pantheon of all these other gods throughout the world, he wars against the lizard people, right? He wars against the reptilians. And then you look at the the Shamash Indians, I think they're called in, in, in Southern California. They talk about, you know, lizard people who live underground. The Hopi talk about the ant people. 
uh, that live underground. And that's why they call them the ant people, because they're constantly burrowing and digging tunnel systems, and they come out of the ground and, and, and whatnot. One of my guests on my show, The Cosmic Switchboard, Gary David, he wrote uh, a book about the Hopi uh, Indians and how their villages corresponded to the constellation of Orion. We always hear about, you know, Baval's work about the the belt of Orion corresponding with the, the, the three pyramids in the Giza Plateau. But there are settlements and, and ruins throughout the desert southwest of the U.S. which correspond in minute detail to the Orion constellation. And likewise, in, in Lakota, uh, in the Dakotas, the Lakota Indians, otherwise known as the Sioux, they they say they come from Sirius, and their their black mountains and their their sacred ground. It all has to do with their connections to the stars. So it's in, embedded in the lore, in the institutional memory of all these native peoples around the world that you know we are descended from these extraterrestrials. We, we were brought here. We're not native to this world. And that there are, are occasionally ongoing, actually, wars between the gods, if you will, the various ET races. If you look at Celtic lore, if you look at Greek mythology, these gods were constantly battling with each other. And they had demigods, hybridization, if you will, where uh, Zeus or some other deity would impregnate some human woman and, and out of that have some kind of superhuman offspring, a Heracles kind of archetypal figure who would go out and battle all these chimeras, all these different monsters and, and entities. And you know what's interesting too? The original term uh, meaning for mythos from the original Greek was narrative, actual real history. But they've distorted that meaning. Now the term myth is something fantastical, something unbelievable, something like ridiculous or ludicrous, right? But they've, they've just changed the, the meaning of the word. But if, if you look at the the Greek mythology, and they talk about all these different chimeras, all these animals that have multiple he uh, heads, or they have uh, the body of, uh, of an animal, but the head of a man, and the arms and you know, chest of a man. Well, this is the stories we've been hearing for decades now, out of Dulce, out of China Lake Naval Weapons Center, well, actually underneath it, and other places where a lot of these, uh, these geneticists are at work. They're, again, there's no ethics, there's no morality, there's no self-restraint. They've got the DNA, they've got the funding, and they're in these underground bases, and they're making all kinds of different entities, which, quite frankly, were never meant to exist, right? And so it's an example where, it, it, in modern times, Greek mythology is playing itself out all over again, right? So, you know, people need to keep that in mind. Also, the whole cloning aspect, too. There's there's a lot of cloning going on, and, you know, of, of, of humans, of, of entities, and, and what have you. So it's, it's a mixed bag. And so the point of relevance is, going back to your question, whether it's the Celts, whether it's uh, the Greeks and, and, and what have you, there was always this intrinsic connection between the native peoples of any region and the gods, the, the centrality of the gods, where they didn't want to make a move without, you know, getting some kind of omen, uh, some propitious omen from the gods. And they would even resort resort to animal or human sacrifices in order to do that. Uh, votive offerings, right, in some places where they would give food or, 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 you know, tobacco or whatever the case may be because they were well aware that there is a larger uh, panorama, uh, unseen and seen realms all around us populated by the different categories and varieties of beings. This is where modern humanity has been left in the dust. We're so reductionist. We... We're almost hopeless in that regard. Uh, we don't realize the nature of the yourself, multiple mate. threat environment we're in. I mean, that's the bottom line. It is a multiple. Earth is a multiple threat environment, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, like, um, you mentioned Greek mythology bef before, and the first person that popped to my mind was Tom DeLonge, who wrote that book, Secret Machines. When he was doing a little bit of digging and talking to high military whistleblowers, they all sort of pulled him aside, Matt, and said, we can't tell you stuff. But look at Greek mythology. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, Norse mythology. Yep. Right? Uh, it's all got to come from somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah. It, it's all got to come from somewhere. And there's always this group of gods and goddesses and demigods, half-breeds, uh, hybrids is the term we would use today of these people. And then we have all the stories of the Mylabs and the 
so-called super soldiers, which is a term I don't like to use, but in a lot of these my labs, just as the case with these mystic seers, adepts throughout the ages, they can manifest, for lack of a better term, superhuman powers, as far as telekinesis, as far as remote viewing, as far as biolocation, some of these, what these yogis do. Anyone out there who's read an autobiography, autobiography of a yogi about uh, from Paramahansa Yogananda knows mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. Or read uh, the book about Black Elk, right? Uh, the Secret Teachings of, of Lakota, I think it's called. Uh, or also the book Rolling Thunder talks about the Shoshone uh, intertribal medicine man, Rolling Thunder. These guys were and, and women are capable of doing extraordinary things. And I should remind your listeners, you're all capable of doing the same thing, too. We've just been detuned from that fact. We've been subjected to all the shame-based programming, operant conditioning. And, and now we're, we're so shame-based, we think that we're made to think that we have to merge with machines in order to have any kind of future, and to have any kind of destiny. It's so ridiculous. I love this man. <laughs> <laughs> I love this man, man. Back at you, bro. Well, look, honestly, it's the truth. The truth is the truth. That's all you yeah, can say. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. That's all you can say about it. You guys got to come on my show, too, definitely. The Cosmic Switchboard. Oh, oh, believe me, we'll give you a plug on that one in a minute. <laughs> we'll definitely let you at the end of this. You can plug yourself, you know, plug in, plug away. That's what we're here for. We want to make sure our people know exactly who you are and back exactly what you're about. And it's another great reference and resource for people who are trying to do the real work that needs to be done, which is basically the work that will allow us to. Well, you just said it. Why are we so, and you even hear this now, depending on who you listen to, you hear about, oh, um, Bezos and Kurzweil all wanting to merge with machines and do all this kind of stuff. It's ridiculous. I'm going to play devil's advocate here and say that they're part of the reptilian program. Yes, they are. I, I would say that they the reptilians really themselves are a manifestation of this AI. I mean, and I think some of them are afraid of it at some level. Some are too ego-driven to not care. I think that there are good reptilians uh, around that want to get off the, the treadmill. They, they see that they have a window of opportunity, a window of time in which they can progress with their spiritual evolution. They don't want to be a parasite anymore. They don't want to be part of the Borg Collective. So mm. more and more we're seeing literally reptilians, although I've never heard of a case of a Draco, but I've known of cases of reptilians and dragons. Believe me, there are dragons coming to healers and asking for healing. Uh, the, the problem they've had is these interdimensional snake entities has embedded themselves into, well, these snake entities embed themselves into people, into entities, into reptilians, take them over and thereby plug them into this Borg collective. So, and more and more of these entities are asking for healings and so they can get off the treadmill so they can continue their spiritual journey because they see the direction it's headed. If, if we don't change this, if we don't fix this now, we've got a window of opportunity. Uh, this whole soul harvesting, recyclement agenda, it will continue and this, this earth will be plunged into a very dark place. Another thing I don't like about the New Agers, okay, is they're so intent on ascending and their attitude seems to be, well, you know, this old earth, I no longer have use for it. I'm washing my hands of it. Yeah, this old earth that sustained you up until how, now. many incarnations and yeah. now you're just going to wash your hand of it because you just want to ascend, you know, to some other dimension. But, you know, I feel that as the case with the native peoples of this world, we have a responsibility to this earth, to the life forms on this planet, and that if we do what we need to do, not only do we break this cycle of soul harvesting and, and recyclement, but we, we remove the toxicity from this world, we remove the pollution and allow this planet to, to heal from all the trauma it's been subjected to for so long. Agreed. Um, another one I was looking at when you were talking about the different um, oh, different things about, you know, healing the planet and things along those lines and the fact that there are people that, um, there are entities that can come through and they actually want to attach to human beings. Um, Edward Dingle, who started Mental Physics way back when, which was out in Joshua Tree in California, um, he found out that in a prior life he was a Tibetan mystic and he wrote a paper on his experience of going back to China in the 1920s, which was a heck of a lot earlier than a lot of people from the West went to China, and what he actually went through, and the fact that he actually found, for lack of a better term, memorabilia, or his own personal property from when he actually existed as a Tibetan monk and a mystic. And one of the things in the books that I found really fascinating was the fact that he would explain about bilocation, about the different cities, as they call them, in certain religious, um, in certain religious um, circles. 
um, in those cities are, in a sense, yes, heightened awareness, heightened sensitivities, able to move and uh, manipulate matter. But as one of my teachers told me, you can never get really hung up on the ceremony because that will keep you bound. And what you have to do is learn to use these things and then to move on beyond that. And you're also quite correct, in my opinion at least, when it comes to this planet Earth. A lot of people out there have said this, and at times you get frustrated and you say, look, I'm tired of this place, I want to move on to the next phase of the next level. In a lot of those next phases and next levels, the exact same thing is happening. Just like here. A little bit different, maybe a little bit higher frequency, maybe a little bit lower frequency, but people there, entities there, are still trying to break free of that cycle. Well, I'm going to put this to you, right? Throw me your opinion on this. If you were to be upgraded, as in vibrationally upgraded and moving to the next level, therefore, would you not have a responsibility to make sure that the level you left behind was in as good or if not better condition than what you left it? I would think so. I would think so, too. James, what about you? Yeah, I would feel the same way because, see, another thing about Orthodox religion, it's so shame-based. Fire and brimstone, I mean, we come to this incarnation, well, we only live once, and we come in as original sinners on top of that, right? And then we live a life of sheer drudgery and seeking out a subsistence uh, existence, and then when we die, it's like if we're lucky, you know, we go to heaven. If not, we're going to suffer eternal damnation. So even the way that they've got the the the, the paradigm set up with, with the Orthodox religion, so everything is based on shame, everything is based on guilt, everything is based on fear. But when you look at it from a higher dimensional perspective, you see, we have not been cast adrift. That's another thing that these fundies, fundamental religionists, uh, would have us believe, that you know, we have to prove our worth to like these higher powers. Well, the fact of the matter is, these benevolent, highly evolved spiritual beings in many different higher spiritual realms, they look at us as, man, you guys are and gals, you're doing the tough work. You, you're, you're down there in physical embodiment in this matrix where the system is run by psychopaths who've been taken up as hosts by these malevolent entities. They're rapidly making artificial intelligence the norm in your civilization, right? And so, you see, the worst thing that can happen is if this planet just becomes a cord out irradiated husk of its former self. It's a living organism. It's nurtured us through many incarnations. So if we take it as a given that there are intelligences at higher spiritual realms who do have our best interest at heart, who in many ways are our air cover and ground cover, although they're oftentimes their help is nuanced and very subtle and seemingly at times non-existent, right? When we're really going through some, you know, challenges and struggles. When we look at it from that standpoint, okay, we've got all this help. It's in the unseen realms, and we have a destiny to fulfill. And every time we stray off course or go off the rails, some kind of internal navigation kicks in and gets us back on course. Well, the planet itself has a, has a consciousness. It's nurtured us lifetime after lifetime. Why shouldn't we have this custodial kind of mindset? that the, the aboriginals in Australia do, that the Native Americans and, and other indigenous societies do. They live at one with the environment. And look how distorted everything is. We have fracking, right? Mm. Yeah, they're, they're literally polluting the groundwater and distorting and causing all these earthquakes. And then you have chem spraying. Me and a friend were talking about this the other day, and he has a sense of humor like I do. It's like we just kept laughing about the whole thing, the, the sheer lunacy of it. Welcome back to Beyond 3D this Saturday evening. Clint and Matt sitting here in the studio having a great discussion, a great conversation with James Bartley. So welcome back, everybody. Now, James was just referring to chemtrails, which is... Um Near and dear to our hearts here in Mornington. No, near and dear to our hearts, James, because uh, regularly they spray over top. Yeah, and they do that in, in every big city. And it's an example, another example of, our, of our, our planet crying out in pain, right? It's just constantly being hammered. And there's a nano uh, element to it. There's a DNA element to it. Because what they do, as you know, it's, it's not just a binary weapon system. It's, it's a multiple weapon system all in combination. So people ingest all these heavy metals, and then, and then the airwaves are being hammered with these carrier frequency waves 
which interface and interact with all the heavy metals and possibly nanites that people have ingested, right? Just by living and breathing here. So the whole planet is, is under attack. So if we do our job right, and this planet has cleansed itself again and again. And here's another thing, too. When you hear these people say, oh, you know what, these selectively driven cataclysms, yeah, I can believe that they happen. Well, they do, because it's in the fossil record, mass extinction events, and it's in the geological record. The Himalayas are only like eight, 9,000 years old. Now, think about that. Highest mountain range in the world. What kind of upheavals created that, right, that mountain range? But when people say, oh, no, if we really just focus our intent, and then we won't have these celestially driven cataclysms, and my attitude is, wait a minute, you're saying Mother Earth doesn't have the right to heal herself? You're saying, because you're afraid, you're saying she, Mother Earth, does not have the, uh, the, the right to cleanse herself of all this toxicity, hatred, bad energy that's built up inside of her for, for eons now, right? And I think, again, it's an example of this self-entitled uh, narcissistic mindset, which is the norm for so many people, even in the so-called awake, aware community, like these New Agers. They just want to, you know, they just want to, like, leave and, you know, leave the earth to, it, you know, wash their hands of the earth and go on to the next level, because they're always going on and on about, you know, going to the next level and going to the next vibration, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we're here to be embodied. We're here to anchor ourselves to Mother Earth and through Mother Earth as source and, and pull in higher dimensional frequencies, right, in the form of downloads, insights, um, past remembrances that help us in the now, right, the eternal now. So the New Ages have got it all backwards. And, it is, and they would have it, I just think that everything's all hunky-dory, that all the ETs out there are of the warm and fuzzy variety, and they're into shaming uh, Clinton, Matt. They're into shaming people. Oh, you think you've had a negative experience? That just means you're, you're spiritually unevolved, you're spiritually retarded, right? Well, what about all the children out there that, that are afraid to go to sleep at night? They dread the onset of evening. They sleep with the lights on. They're afraid even to go into their bedrooms during the day because, you know, at a very conscious and unconscious level, they've been subjected to trauma. Matt and I have both been members of that club. We've been visited at night when we were kids and everything like that. Absolutely. Yeah, and I have too. Mm. I mean, I mean, I had to wean myself off of sleeping with the lights on. To this day, I can sleep beneath a bare light bulb and, you know, with no problems at all because of all the years I've slept, you know, with the lights on and, and the, the trauma I, I endured and waking up with nosebleeds but the pillow was saturated with blood and, and all this other stuff, right? Yep. I'll tick that box. And, and so, you know, we have to have compassion. I, have to, I ask these new agers that have this mentality, where's your empathy? Where's your compassion? And if they have that attitude towards an adult who's, who reports having, you know, less than pleasant experiences, by extension, it must mean they feel the same way towards kids. But see, they mask it all. They, they, they invert everything by calling kids indigo kids and everything else, you know. Yeah, some of these kids are very gifted. And they're very uh, special, especially if they slip through the cracks and don't get too vaccine damaged in our day and age, right? Mm. But, you know, another thing about the indigo kids is if, if you do have a very special gifted child, you don't want to broadcast it and tell everybody about it either. They're going to wind up being plugged into some mind control project or something. So, you know, a lot of these new agers, just more and more people are waking up to their shtick. They, they recognize them for many of them for being entity infested entity controlled right and and i hate to be to sound like i'm you know slinging mud at them but but somebody has to call them out for all the harm they've done because the consciousness working through a lot of them is not human i'm here to <laughs> i know you guys know that but I'm, I'm here to tell your listeners that you know a lot of these people they seem like harmless new agers uh, anything but but the entities working through them the entity attachments the hook the bogus soul agreements they're plugged into uh, you hang around some of these people, they can pull you into all kinds of intrigue that, that works at many different dimensions, many different levels. So just be wary of who you interact with uh, in this day and age. Uh, we, we usually do, don't we, Matt? Oh, without a doubt. Oh, believe me, I've been through enough. Thank you. Hey, um, James, how are these uh, reptilian entities viewed by the rest of the uh, interstellar, interdimensional club? Well... Unlike what the New Ages would have us think that everything is hunky-dory out there, there is constant warfare in the cosmos and, and even in higher dimensions, right? You just made a point that, uh, Matt, a little while ago, that even in higher dimensions, uh, you know, it's not all hunky-dory. There, there's 
there's, there's conflict, there's challenges, there's oh, acrimony and strife. Absolutely. And, and, and that's the case with these reptilians. Uh, I'm talking about the more warlike, predatory, parasitic variety of reptilians in Draco. And they've warred since time immemorial with certain ET races. The, the feline beings come to mind, the lion humanoids, they really exist. And, uh, and other types of beings. And some beings, some races, they have kind of a go along to get along, it seems, attitude with the reptilians. They will parlay with them. They'll interact with them at some level. They'll have meetings and conferences with them. And I, I don't know how deeply they get involved with them on occasion, right? I, I'm sure that they, because I've spoken to people who were present at meetings between, say, factions of Palladians, reptilians, factions of the Greys, and they were present when they were hammer, hammering out some kind of concord or some kind of understanding. So those things do go on. And contrary to what the David Jacobs and other researchers like him would have you believe, where it's just all Greys and hybrid variants uh, thereof, it's quite the opposite. There's a bewildering variety of entities out there. In the context of one experience, one could see several different types of ETs, mantis beings, reptilians, insectoids, et cetera, et cetera. And so they're, they're, you know, people think they roll their eyes when they hear, hear terms like alliances and federations, et cetera, but they really do exist because how else would you explain in the context of one experience? And sometimes people are taking the big space stations or, or uh, off world taking the big installations and they see a bewildering variety of different ETs of all stripes. So, you know, these consortiums, these alliances and counter alliances, they really exist. So what the reptilians have done, to get back to your question, Clint, is they seem to have like created a sphere of influence for themselves in this part of the galaxy. And they, they regard the Earth as their own. And a lot of these beings come here because of the genetic diversity here and also because of all the souls here, right? Uh, there's a big logjam of, of souls here because of the soul recyclement process. And so what a lot of the more benevolent ET races have done higher dimensional ET races is they've gotten volunteers basically to incarnate a number of times here on the earthly plane. Sometimes we incarnate as basically the bad guys or less than pleasant guys, not always the good guys. But in the overall scheme of things, we needed to have that, that level of learning, level of understanding, military strategic understanding, let's say in the cases of some people. And so now in the eternal now, they reincarnate again. And they're basically the, the genetic and spiritual progeny of a number of different higher dimensional ET races. And in fact, some people have incarnated into the Draco civilization, into some of the more negative reptilian uh, uh, civilizations in order to you know, pass on their morphogenetic blueprint resonance through DNA, etc., and then they begin reincarnating once, twice, maybe more into this bloodline that they've created in these Draco, in these reptilian civilizations. So, and then also when they come into earthly incarnations and they wind up being a Mongol or being some kind of conqueror, right? They have that in their genetic soul memory. They have that in their DNA profile. They have that in their morphogenetic blueprint resonance. And now, you know, we are the sum of all of our parts. Even when we were bad guys in past incarnations, that could help us now. You know, we have to forgive ourselves for whatever we've done in this life and forgive ourselves for whatever we may have done in a past life because it was all for a greater good. We were on a deep, deep undercover mission. And just like, you know, sleeper agents being activated after many years, now, you know, over time, more and more people are coming to an awareness, well, this really is a matrix. It's just like that Matrix movie with Keanu Reeves and... You know, we have a role to play. We're being activated, but we haven't been cast adrift. You know, we do have air cover, but we cannot rely on them either. We have to work as if we're on our own and, you know, just, just get on with the job, basically. Thank you, James. Yeah, we're coming up to the end of the show, James. I wanted to get a one question and a quick question about something that's near and dear to our hearts, being that we're down here in Australia right now. What is your opinion on what is happening with all the news around Antarctica? Well, I do believe that Antarctica, uh, there are some underground bases there. There are ancient, advanced human civilizations as well as advanced ET races uh, beneath the, uh, the ice there. 
And it's quite possible, indeed likely, that elements of, of the militaries of various nations have gone down there to exploit technology, to, to find technology. And this kind of information is starting to leak out in the form of novels and, and you know, alleged whistleblower testimony, etc. Now, you know, to, to give it some perspective, we know that there are underground bases in, in Australia, in America, elsewhere where humans and non-human life forms coexist and work in unison side by side. So it's not such a stretch to think that something similar goes on in our Antarctica. But I do believe that clues have been passed in the form of science fiction, in the form of novels, etc., and also some whistleblower testimony. I've spoken to people who, who feel that they've been taken to Antarctica um, in a MyLab context. A MyLab is a legitimate alien abductee who on occasion, sometimes quite frequently, is uh, abducted by deep black elements of the military and, and utilizes an operative or variously as an administrator, as a medical person. Or it depends on the skill set that the person has, skill sets, because some of them have altered personalities, and each personality has its own unique skill set, right? Uh, and so I do believe something is, uh, is going on in Antarctica, but you know, at the t at the time, I'm not really familiar with all that's going on down there. But I, but I I should mention that in the now defunct a great website, uh, the Mars Anomaly Research website by Joseph P. Skipper, which has since been taken down, uh, there was some imagery there of it Antarctica. They they tried their level best to smudge out a lot of it, but what you see is uh, in the areas that are not smudged out are huge fields of what seems to be like green glass. Now think of think of the Trinitite, right, where, you know, they set off an atomic blast and it fuses the soil and fuses the mm. sand and leaves all this glass all over the place. Well, this was a continuous field of green glass and it was gigantic. But again, that very fine website uh, has been taken down and, and no one really knows what's happened to Joseph B. Skipper since. So if anyone's archived that kind of stuff, you know, look it up. Thanks for that, James. Yeah, that's cool. Hey, um, last question for the evening, mate, before we let you go on this fine Saturday night. Um, you were involved in the filming of Chris Turner's Don't Mention the Reptilians documentary. Yes, yes. Chris is a great guy, by the way. No, he's, he's not. <laughs> I was going to say, give us some gentlemanly dirt on the man. <laughs> yeah, he's working on a new doco. It's about cryptids, in particular Sasquatch uh, beings in the UK. Uh, which is interesting because people think of it as an island nation and, you know, what goes on there, oh, quite a lot, apparently. So there's a lot of Sasquatch activity, and he's been you know, on the move interviewing all these people who've had first-hand encounters. So, uh, yeah, I was on that documentary, and also I was uh, invited to speak at the very first RepCon, which uh, Chris Turner put together in Barry in Barry, UK, which is a, a, a suburb of Manchester. So yeah. I, was, I was just there this time last year. And uh, there was four speakers at this event, and uh, I gave one of the presentations about reptilians, and it was quite an honor. Excellent. Thank you, James, for tonight. Matt, any other questions before we let James go? James, there'd be too many questions, so we're going to have to definitely invite you back. I've got a list, a big list, but Literally, we're only a one-hour show. But what we have to do right now is Thank you man. need to represent. Yeah. And so what are you doing book-wise? What are you doing um, lecture-wise, websites, etc. Give our uh, listeners uh, a brief um, synopsis of where they can get more information from you. Plug yourself, you can, man. Yeah, you can go to the Cosmic Switchboard dot com, the Cosmic Switchboard dot com, and you can find uh, my my podcast there and some articles by myself and, and guest writers. Every middle of the week, I give a commentary where it's just me talking, and it, on the weekends. Uh, uh, Saturdays for people in Australia, Fridays for people in the U.S. I have a guest, and, you know, they have the floor. They, they talk about uh, any subject dear to their heart. And I'm on a lecture series. I haven't come up with the new date. My most recent lecture was in Melbourne, actually. It was a suburb of Mel Melbourne, Burwood. Burwood. I, I gave about a three-and-a-half-hour, four-hour speech there. Uh, a few weeks ago, and, mm. uh, and a couple of months before that, I gave a speech in a suburb of Sydney. So when I have another speech in Australia, I'll definitely let you guys know and, and, oh, and pass it on, because uh, Melbourne is dear to my heart. I love that city. It's about my favorite city in the world, and and I just love the Australian people. I uh, I can't say enough about you know Australia and, and the people in it. So 
uh, it, it was a special place in my heart. And also, if I also do consults, so if anyone has had reptilian my lab experiences, uh, you know, contact me and we can set something up. And James, what we'll do is we'll put all of that information up on the Facebook page and the websites so everybody can get access to that information. So a lot of information has gone through tonight, Clint. So we have I'm to just... thanks. Many, many thanks. Super oh, impressed. Thank you. Super beyond, impressed with the man. Beyond description to James Bartley, guys. Um, we will return after a quick break, but James, thank you for your time, and hopefully thank we'll you. get to speak again. Take care, but, the fellas. Bye. Good, good, good night, night, James. Good night. I don't, know, I don't know about you, Clint, but I'll tell you what. <laughs> I've wrapped. That was awesome. I'm wrapped as well. Now, here's the thing. We have to get back together with James again, because there is just... We didn't even do 1% of the information that we could have covered. I just, uh, I was playing Information Kino. I was mm. just ticking off <laughs> just probably about a, a tenth, yeah. about a tenth of the things we could have spoken to him. Yeah, that's the tonight. thing. It, it's, it's one of those interviews that you just love doing and we'll love having him back on this show. So that is it for this week, guys, for Beyond 3D. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Check our Facebook page to see exactly what's new from this week and the things that will be going beyond. We're usually a few days ahead when it comes to the news and things like that that hit mainstream. You'll enjoy that as well. When are we not? Yeah, what are you going to do? That's just the way it is. When you're in tune, you're in tune. Take care. We will catch you next week with another edition of Beyond 3D. Good night, everybody. Good night. Just because you haven't experienced it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. 